Hey there everybody, Joe here. Thanks for tuning in again. So now I'm going to get started on the mountains now that I have the sky done on this painting. And uh, I'm using a little bit different brush today, but it's the same style of brush. I always like to use these brushes. They have synthetic bristles and they, they come to a nice sharp blade-like tip. And I always use those because then I can do skinny lines this way or I can do wide lines this way. I like the control that it gives me. So even though the brush looks different than last week, it's the same style of brush and uh, I just kind of grab whatever's laying around. I'm not real particular about the brand. And uh, I want to say thank you to Turbo for mentioning my site and my video getting started with materials and paint. You can get that at learn.muraljoe.com and see all about the materials that I'm using right now. You can also go to the, the FAQ on that same site and, and read about the kind of paint that I like to use. So I'm just popping the lids off of these gallons and I'll keep one lid handy so that I can mix paint on it if I need to and the rest I'll just throw down on the bottom shelf of my rolly cart here. I always use one of these carts that roll around, you know, like they use in, in hospitals. <laughs> uh, it's, it's really handy when I'm doing larger jobs too because you're just rolling down the hall with all of my gallons of paints. It's not easy to put those all on a palette. These paints are a lot more runny. Uh, they, they, they will run a lot easier than what you'll get in tubes if you're using the artist tubes. Now, all of, the, all of this painting can be done with oil paint or tube acrylics. Uh, any kind of paint can be used because all I'm doing is putting color in certain places to get the look. Now, to do the mountains, I, I want to decide what color they are. I don't like to guess on things. I like to have a calculated method. So even if I don't know exactly, it's, it's nice to just have a method to come, come to a, a, a conclusion about what color I want to use. So rocks can be gray uh, or they can be grayish brown maybe kind of orange here in arizona we have a lot of very orange colored rocks or, or uh, you might hear them called red rocks if if uh, you come to sedona which is really close by they call that really rusty color the the red rocks well uh, in reality they're more of an orange and the reason i specify that is because if you pull up the color triangle so let's look at that now another good good suggestion by turbo directly between what would be the sky blue on that triangle and any any orange on there you're going to see something that is a slightly violet shade of gray so they're they're pretty opposite colors on that triangle but not completely polar opposites so so you get a kind of a violet that that is the result. So that's valuable to know because if I want to do anything that is brownish on this mountain, then brown just think of as a dark shade of orange. So anything that's on that brown side of gray is going to make the result a little more violet. Just like on that triangle, everything that is, you know, from orange down to the red, all of that gets more and more violet as it mixes with these, this sky blue. So the way you use that triangle is you just look at what is directly between the two colors that you're mixing. And it help, it's helpful to know something like a brown is just a dark shade of orange. So let's say I want to have like a grayish brown color on rocks here. Then I want to make sure I put just the, the littlest bit of a violet hue in this mountain. So I'm going to mix red and blue. And since it's just barely a little bit of color, I'm going to mostly stick with the blue and then just lighten it. And so what you're going to have is a darker and grayer shade of blue that's also a little bit violet. If the rocks on this mountain were slightly brown. So what if they were completely gray? In Colorado, a lot of the rocky, rocky mountains there have very gray rocks. And if you had that, then you would really just have a grayer, darker blue. Uh, and so I would just make something very similar to the sky color. So, 
you know, let's let's try that one too. Here we can we can make this one. This one's more distant here, this peak. And so that one, I'm just gonna put blue and white, just like my sky. And then I'll try adding just a little bit of black. Now, whenever you add any color to blue, I mean, this is a good thing to remember, whenever you add just about any color to blue, it gets a little bit green. It gets a little bit more green than, than what it would do if it was natural light. So it's good to just uh, routinely add a little bit of red every time you mix with blue. So a little bit of red will be all I need. You know, I'm just gonna get rid of the excess on my brush. It's a tiny bit, just enough to keep this from getting too green when I add black. See, I'm gonna mix the blue with black and I just know from experience that when I mix it with black, it's gonna be a little bit greener than what I want it to be. So the goal is to have an end result of just a grayer, darker blue that's like the sky. And that'll be my distant mountain color. If my mountain was more of a gray mountain and not with those rusty colored red rocks. So you can do either. And here, you see how I just have that barely, barely a shade darker than the sky. So it's gonna look real distant because of how similar I made it in value. When I say value, that means how dark or how light it is. If you converted it to a black and white picture, what would be you know, the contrast? How dark is it? How light is it? That's value. It has, has nothing to do with color. So the value is very similar to the sky on this distant mountain. So that's gonna make it look nice and far away. So these little differences can often be overlooked by an artist when painting a background, but, but your eyes are very perceptive to those tiny changes and help to determine the interpretation of the painting. Okay, so this front one, you know, I, I, I could, it'd be good if I made the colors consistent. So if I wanted it to look like more reddish colored rocks, I might use that little bit of violet. Um, you know, I, I kind of like the gray for this picture. I like that gray color. So maybe I'll, I'll stick with more of a gray on this. So let me add some blue. And I've got a bucket of water handy. You know, I constantly dip my brush in that water and just, just slap it right on that canvas. And this is a technique that I use when I'm just trying to move quick and just get a picture done. If I was trying to do something that had a, a fancier finish in the end with nicer texture, I might switch to oil base because that really preserves the brush strokes. While this paint, it does shrink a lot. So if you're interested in preserving the texture of your brush strokes, then this is not the ideal medium. But if you're just after the practice, you know, getting the right colors in the right places, this is ideal because it's such a fast method to make progress. Okay, so now all I'm gonna do is try to make this same color, but just a little bit darker as this is closer. And the reason it's darker is not because foreground is automatically darker. Foreground isn't always darker and background isn't always lighter. The background is always more the color of the atmosphere and the atmosphere here is this light blue. So I'm assuming that my rocks are just a darker shade. Rocks, trees, sticks, whatever's on this mountain are just a darker shade than the sky, which is a pretty safe assumption. So the closer it gets, the more of the natural color of the mountain I would see and the less of the atmosphere color I would see. You know, you can even see that effect uh, sometimes with just a hundred feet difference. You know, if you, if you go outside and you look at this tree that's in your front yard, then look at another tree that's a hundred feet behind it, then, it, you know, sometimes it's good to close one eye or whatever tactics you want to use to try to identify just the colors you're seeing. You'll notice that the colors on the close tree are bolder and a lot of times darker. <clears throat> and the shadows, you know, just like the, uh, just like the shadows will get lighter when, uh, when a thing is further away. The, um, the highlights sometimes will get darkened by the atmosphere 
you won't have quite as bright of highlights because they're fogged out by, by that blue. This is kind of a little brush to be trying to make quick progress with. So now here's where you know you can really really get particular with the detail. So this one to me looks a little more violet than this one. So to make my background look real consistent, to make it, I want it to look like it's just a continuous background getting further and further away. I don't want to have those little color differences because when you're this far away, tiny differences represent big differences. So I want to, I want to really strive to, to get that hue consistent. So I'm going to go a little bit more violet just because this, this distant mountain is a little bit more violet. I'm just uh, putting water on my brush and then smearing it around. There we go. Now to go faster, I'm going to switch to a bigger brush. Put blue, a little bit of red, right? We got that, and then let's throw the white on there. Okay, try to get some similar. Oh yeah, and I put a little black. Some black in there. And then I'll get some water. Not bad. Let's get a little bit more of that white. Come over here while I'm at it. So I'm gonna come down this far because I've got some little foothills that are in front of these peaks. So, you know, a trick that you'll see in many paintings is adding a little more white as it gets down into the valleys so that you have what looks like settling atmosphere in there. Maybe it's fog, maybe it's campfire smoke, I don't know. It's atmosphere. Atmospheric haze is what I've heard it called a lot of the time. I don't know terminology that well. <laughs> uh, many times people have struck up conversations with, with, you know, very sophisticated terminology with me and I'm just lost and like, I don't know, <laughs> I don't know what things are. All I know is how they look. Okay, let's do that. I'm just trying to add some little bumps and curves on the top of that. Okay, so that's not too bad for starters. You know, we have a, a couple of mountains there in the distance. So what makes them look big and far away, again, is being similar to the sky color. And the more similar they are to the sky, the more buried back in that sky they're going to look. And then when I add the foreground in, that's, that's going to help it even more. Add a little bit more white in that base. And then since this one's further here, this mountain is the further of the two. So I'm going to add more white to the base right there. So see, I'll just cut this in. And even though my paint is starting to dry a little bit up there, I'll just do my best to fade that in. There we go. I like the way that looks. All right, so how about these hills? Now, same thing. Uh, if, if I imagine atmosphere makes, let's say these are covered with some dark green, dark forest greens. And so I, I just want a green mixed with the blue, right? But it's only a little bit of green because it's kind of a dark green. It's got a lot of shadow. It's not a real brilliant green. So mostly the blue, little bit of green. And those are, are uh, very similar with paint as they are with light, but the difference with mixing uh, blue light and green light is that with light, the blue doesn't disappear when they mix as much. If, if you mix green paint with blue paint, then the green is going to kind of dominate. You're going to have a lot of green. So if we pull up that, that color triangle again, and if you look at the result that is directly between green and blue, you see that it's, it looks like a light blue. So I want to, the point in that is that I want to stick with a lot of blue. If I'm mixing only a little bit of green with, with my blue atmosphere and then, and then a lot of darkness because this is a dark green on these hills, 
then it's going to be mostly a blue color, just like on that color triangle between the green and the blue is, is mostly a blue looking color. So let's go, uh, since we're not after a real brilliant green, I'm just going to add yellow to my blue. I would add green to my blue if I really wanted something with a more brilliant green. But I use yellow whenever I want something that's more muted, earthy tones. So this is my closest hill on my sketch. You can see that this is just a, a very saturated blue-green color. And so I definitely want to tone that down. I'm going to add black and white. And I could just add, I could just add red and probably get a similar result. Watch, this is kind of fun. See right there, I just added black to it. Now watch, watch this. Here, I'll just add red and blue. And it'll be a very similar result. See, watch. <laughs> See how similar that is? Because the, the red being an opposite color, you know, just kills it. And then if I add more yellow to this one, so you can get the same color through different methods. See, I added yellow to this now because blue killed some of that yellow. So you can see I get very similar results, but it's easier if I want to darken green, black and white is an easier thing to remember. I'm getting off track here. Okay, add some white. I'm thinking a little bit more black. And a little more white. While I'm at it, I'll just use that color over here with some more white. And since each of these hills gets further away, we should have more blue as it gets further. I tend to use my brush with, with notice that these are the same kind of brush too. You know, this, this is a, a, just a little one inch width and it's skinny this way, wide this way. Same with this one. I like it for the same reason. Skinny this way, wide this way. This is just more of a contractor style brush. <coughs> you know, where this one's more for art. Okay, so making our hills and I got little hill, let's add some water to that. And a little itch on my forehead. <laughs> okay. More black and white, I want that to be a little more gray because it's looking kind of on the bright turquoise side. You just don't want real saturated colors. If something is distant, you don't want to see things that don't look kind of grayish. You know, you want it to be real, uh, real muted. Muted meaning more gray, less colorful. Yeah, so just like value has a very specific definition, lightness and darkness. When, if I say saturated, saturated means how much color can you see in it? So, you know, a primary red is very saturated. And these colors are not very saturated because they're closer to gray. So the closer to gray it is, the less saturation it has. And those, you know, those were the original, those were the dials on your, on your old TVs that had the hue, the saturation, and the, um, maybe they didn't have value, maybe they had contrast, you know, I don't know. Anyways, that's what, that's what saturation means if I say that. Let's put more black and white in this one. There we go. There, so see how these are very similar. By the time I get over here, it's hard to even tell the difference between this color and this color. Even though this one's green, this one's more violet. But they're just very similar in value uh, and 
and uh, they're very both very close to gray, so it's hard to tell the differences. I'll go ahead and add a little bit of darkness just to make the, the hill stand out just a, a little bit more. That's up to you how much you want it to stand out. Let's put a little more of this foreground color on the second one. My goal is to get a, a consistent change from the distant to the nearby. There we go. Now I'll just kind of take the tip of my brush and if I dab that on there, I can get little points, you know, things that you might remember from Bob Ross. Man, I love watching that guy. It's amazing to me that uh, he still sells so much after he's passed away. He still does, you know, make such a difference. It's a cool thing. I used to just, just be amazed watching him do his little trees and then a big pine tree. Done. I wish that guy was still around. Right now I'm just adding some white to the base of this hill. And here's a fun little trick. If you're doing a distant shore and you already have something that's kind of green, so in, in terms of paint, you know, if you add red to green, you get a very grayish result. Uh, and so if I add a little bit of red down here, and then some white. That red mixing with the green is gonna make a dark shadow when it starts to mix, and then the white will give me the highlight of maybe a shoreline coming out. And maybe I add just the tiniest bit of yellow if it looks a little bit, a little bit more purple than I want it to, but, but the yellow can be overdone real quick. A tiny bit goes a long way. So I'm gonna mix this until that red creates a shadow. Let's get a tiny bit more of that red. Like I said, uh, the yellow gets overdone real quick. Okay, and then the white coming out from under there. There we go. See now I have a distant shoreline coming across the base. I can do that all over. Wherever I have, wherever I have some green, let me add a little bit of. You know, this this is something that I can use a small brush for. Yeah, much easier. Sometimes I forget. See, and I just mix it enough that that red gets mixed with the green and no longer looks very red. And then after it's mixed, I come back with my white on top of that brownish gray that the red and the green made. And below that shadow, I put the highlight of the shore. Shoreline coming out. So that could be a sandy beach or maybe just some, maybe just some dirt and rocks, I don't know. and put a little bit more of that right here. I like the way that looks. You know, and if the sun is really striking that ground, sometimes if you look in photographs where the sun is shining directly on the ground, it can be very white, very light colored because the exposure is so high. There we go. Now we have our hills coming forward. And, you know, I still think that that is, is a little more saturated than I want it to be. So I don't know if it's too late to change it. I'm gonna test it. Let's just put a little bit of black in there. No, I think it's still wet enough. Today must be a little more humid. And my paint is 
not drying as fast as it usually does. But you know, once I have that nice gradient down there, a little bit nervous to mess it up. Yeah, I like the way that looks better. See, I start with more of a, a very analytical method to get the color I want, but then, you know, it's, it's, it's never perfect. I always to just use my instinctive judgment after I get a good starting point. Like that. Okay, so now we have uh, some hills in here, so I want to decide is this even more distant than this? Where, where is this last hill here? And so uh, maybe I'll do one of each. Maybe I'll do one right here. Let's grab some of this color here where we have blue and a little bit of red. Had to check to see if that was still wet. It's not. And what else did I put in there? Black and white. A little bit of yellow for the green, a little more white for the distance. There we go. That looks good enough for me. <laughs> I say as I add more color. <laughs> good enough. That looks good enough, but I'm going to go ahead and change it. Okay. And then this one, um, I want to make it more like this. So to get to there, hmm, you know, it's going to be a little hard without washing out my brush. Let me switch to my little brush so I don't have quite as much of that green color. And I just need to get rid of some of my paint. Add a little bit of red for the slightly violet tone that that has, and white. So you mix red with blue to get a very gray violet, but you would mix magenta with blue to get a, a more saturated violet. This is magenta. It's like the color of a pomegranate or, or a beet. You know, if you, the juice that comes out of those is very magenta. That's what color this is, and, and it's, it's a big difference between the violet you can get by mixing that with blue versus the, the violet you get with mixing red with blue. So depending if I'm using the red to create shadows or to actually create a, a purple object, this is how I'll choose whether I'm gonna use magenta or red. They're similar, similar looking, so. Maybe that helps to specify the difference between those. Let's put some red on here. Just trying to get this as similar to this other hill as I can before I start adding white to lighten it. I want to make this the most distant hill. So it, even if these peaks are really tall, because they're the most distant, you know, as things get more distant, let's say I'm looking up at a tall person, I'm looking up like this. As they get further away, my line of vision goes down, 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 down to look at that same size person. So the same with mountains. This peak, even though it's dropped down a little below this one, because I've staged it further away, then, then that is the larger peak in the painting. Or it's intended to be. Okay, so now I'm just adding white so I can define that little edge there. Here. Now, something that you got to get used to if you use these these kinds of paint, this kind of paint, is that the the color it is when it's wet is lighter than when it dries. So you have to get accustomed to, if it looks like it matches when it's wet, that means it's a little bit darker and it, it doesn't match. So this color looks almost the same as my sky. So I know that when it dries, 
it's going to be a little bit darker. And if I need it to be lighter than this right here, then I, I have to go even, even lighter than I want it to be. I just have to be mindful that it's going to dry lighter, that's all. See? So that looks a little bit lighter than this up here because it's wet, but when it dries, it's going to be darker. Okay, and then I'm just trying to get that atmosphere effect at the base of these mountains. This is called sweating the small stuff. That's exactly what this is. See, so I'd say don't sweat the small stuff, but I'd be a hypocrite. <laughs> I think a little more blue would look good in that because it's further away than the rest. Right now it doesn't look bluer, so I'm just going to put a touch of the blue. And white. See, because I want to keep that lightness. So every time I add color, I gotta also add white. Nice thing about this, this um, wall paint, this just acrylic latex paint in the gallons, is the white covers really well. The white makes a, a much bigger difference. If you're working with oils, you know, you'll, you'll be doing that all day. You'll be adding white. <laughs> the color is not getting lighter. You know, you got to scrape oil off of the canvas. It's so. Uh, be quite a problem when you're trying to get a nice, when you're trying to lighten the color. All right, I'm stepping back to look at it. So now, now I have some good depth staged here. So, so the next step will be to add, uh, you know, maybe I want some forest going up onto this mountain. So again, that'll be a matter of, of taking, thinking about the way the colors mix, the way the sky color is going to mix with whatever the colors are of those trees going up there. So it'll be something similar to these, of course, because I've already done that. So I'll put some of that going up on these mountains. I'll save that till the next video. Uh, this, this is really important uh, staging for the rest of the picture, the background. You really want to be dialed in so that your foreground looks like foreground and, and looks that much better. So. I hope that this has been a helpful session and I'll look forward to doing the next one with you. Let's take some comments from last week's video. Arch LOLO says, How old are you? Question mark, question mark, question mark, question mark. You must really want to know. I'm 37. I just turned 37 August 5th and I've got the wrinkles to prove it. See, I don't look that young when I'm not on the camera. <laughs> I really like uh, Adam McHugh's comment. You're a good dude, man. You're a good man, dude. Jay Sullivan says, anyone else like the sky better at 2640 than at the end? A lot of times in a painting, you, you learn how far is too far and, and you learn exactly what makes it look worse instead of better by, by actually following through with making the mistakes. So if your goal is to make a perfect painting, you might be a whole lot more cautious about what you're doing. But if your goal is to learn, then making things worse uh, can be valuable learning experience. So I do it all the time. You know, I, I would never say that any of my paintings are as good as they could be. As I go through these comments, I, I notice that a lot of you answered some of, some of the common questions for me and wow, thank you for doing that. You know, so I just want you to know that I appreciate that when there's questions getting answered by people who have, who have already seen these things. Marcio Cauto, do you prefer acrylic? Or oil. What about tempera? Uh, I definitely prefer this kind of acrylic because like I said I can work fast and, and I love making progress and learning. Like I said too though it, it, I like the texture that's left behind with oil based so if I really want to get meticulous and do a really dialed in painting I might use oil. I'm still somewhat new to doing oils you know I, I only posted my my first oil paintings just this last year. What is your favorite artist of these days? Well, Bob Ross, but uh, he's passed away. I don't, I don't have a favorite since then. I hardly even know any artist's names. I can say that Thomas Kincaid really influenced me 
when I was first learning because looking, I was, I was trying to, how does somebody make light look like light? So that was a great influence to me and, and real helpful for me to look at the way colors were used to get those effects. And, and then of course, like I said, Bob Ross, <laughs> just like with minimal effort, just getting this color here, this color here, and just one stroke of a palette knife captured the look of something. And I realized, man, you know, there's, there's a certain look that a thing has that's just the essence of it. And if you can get that, then everything else is secondary. They're, those two were great influences. And you know, I'm someone that just likes to talk to people. When I run into somebody, I just like to, to pick their brain and find out uh, what their techniques are, ask questions if I see something interesting in the painting. It's just been a million people that have influenced me. Sky Parker is pointing out that things look good in threes because of the rule of thirds. I'm, I'm paraphrasing and shortening that comment. And thank you for the nice compliment. So then my question is, but what causes the rule of thirds to exist? Colin Wright says, won't the paint fade in time? Yes, all paint fades in time. But acrylic paint, I don't think fades as quickly as oil-based paint. Uh, but you know what, I'm not, I'm not an expert on those things. Maybe somebody else can chime in and know more than I do, but these uh, acrylics that I like to use are designed to hold their color under uh, the abuse of UV and, and light. Tatuajes Nash, <laughs> that's my best at saying that name, says, really nice videos and job you did. What fabric are you using? Uh, so I think that you're asking what, what uh, is my canvas that I have stretched. So if you look at the painting that I did of the big Jesus on those three panels, when, uh, in, in uh, Knoxville, Tennessee. I built just a simple box with just a board backing and then uh, stretched a canvas over that, just like a traditional canvas that you stretch over your stretcher bars that don't have the backing. But this one just has a board in the middle. You know, I like to be able to jam my brush into it without the canvas bouncing a lot. And it's just, a, I just cut a drop cloth apart. It's a real cheap, easy way to build your surface to paint on is just go buy a canvas drop cloth and cut it up into pieces. The texture is heavier. You know, you have more knots and, and little stitching patterns. It's not as smooth and refined as buying artist canvas. But when I think about how much texture I'm gonna leave with all my paint mixing and all that, that outweighs the imperfection of the little knots and stitches. So I just like going the cheap way, you know, and, and uh, it's more valuable for me to try to demonstrate an affordable method of doing art than to uh, invest in expensive materials for work that's for the purpose of just learning. I'm gonna stop there and I'll look forward to seeing what you have to say next week and I'll see you next time.